How many of you recognize generally the image uh, on the screen? How many of you know that we're not going to talk about that at all today? <laughs> oh, I should say, we do have some uh, visitors here this morning, and I don't know where you sat. Where are you? How many of you are surprised to know that I have friends? What? It's shocking. So some, some of my friends from my uh, childhood, the church that I grew up in in Philly, are here. There are Steve and Kathy in the back. They're waving. They're not standing, but that's okay. We're really, uh, we had a wonderful time with them yesterday and had a great time at the house. And today they're going to see the Pirates and uh, a beautiful stadium. So pray that we don't melt, but it's really nice to have them here. And it's nice to be with all of you this morning. Marty, a little boy, was in church one Sunday with his mother when he started feeling sick. Mommy, he said, can we leave now? No, his mother replied, the servant isn't over yet. Well, I think I'm about to throw up. <laughs> then go out, the front, out of the front door and around to the back of the church and throw up behind a bush, said his mother. <laughs> After about 60 seconds, Marty returned to his pew alongside his mother. Did you throw up? Yes. Marty answered, embarrassed. How could you have gone all the way to the back of the church and returned so quickly? I didn't have to go out of the church. They have a box next to the front door that says, for the sick. <laughs> so, let's look at our text this morning. I'm hoping nobody has to run out of here. Um, please do not go behind the building. Please do not go by the front door if you get sick. We have men's and women's rooms just straight back through those doors. Okay. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. As we have said here before, the, the rest of the book of Colossians is going to deal now with how we're to live out what we believe. As in the rest of Paul's epistles, we begin with teaching on what we are to believe that's always the first section of the, the epistles that Paul writes. This is the doctrinal stuff. This is the theological stuff. This is what we need to know and believe. And then the, the last half of that epistle, he says, now here's how you put that into practice. Here's how that looks like in the real life. It's really important for us to see this relationship on how we are to behave in relationship to what we believe. You see, there are some that say, well, I'll be Christian by just behaving right, but they don't believe right. In fact, they don't even know Christ. What does that make you? A really nice heathen. And I joke, but it's not funny, it's actually true. There are a lot of really nice heathens. I can remember in the home that we uh, grew up in in Philadelphia, our next door neighbors are some of the nicest people you would ever meet in your life. They spent countless hours when I was a kid. It was the next door neighbor that threw the frisbee with me all, all the time, and I played with their dog, and we just had it. We spent a lot of time there. Did they know Jesus Christ? No. Some really nice people. It's so important that we understand that our behavior is a reflection of what we actually believe. We need to believe right so that we can behave right. There is that relationship. Colossians 2, verse 6, we remember, Paul says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You see that relationship? As you've received Jesus, walk in him. There's what you believe and how you live. So why do I bring that to our attention? Because it's going to help us to understand our text today. I want us to see three things. Why three? Because I'm a Baptist preacher, that's why. I want us to look at chosen ones, choosing ones, and charitable ones. 
We're going to talk about the behavior of a Christian. We're going to make sure we understand the relationship of belief to that behavior. So let's look at verse 12 again as we consider this idea of chosen ones. Colossians 3, verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And we're primarily going to look at this point in just the first part of that where he says, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. It's important how Paul describes us. I would assume that the majority of you here today would say, I'm a Christian. I identify as belonging to Christ. Here's how Paul describes you. You ready? God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. I always find it interesting when people describe their relationship with God. And I don't mean in any way to be critical, but I hear people talk about how they found Christ. I found God. Friends, he wasn't lost. (laughs) And you didn't find him. I can assure you he found you. You were chosen. You didn't choose him, he chose you. A number of years ago, it was popular to have a, and I'm sure it still is popular in many churches, to have a seeker-sensitive worship service. How many of you have heard that that phrase, seeker-sensitive? Okay? There are churches that will describe themselves as seeker-sensitive, or they'll say, uh, once a month, we're going to have a seeker-sensitive service. Seriously. On Sundays. I'm kidding. Anyway. um, So, let me just ask you, How many people do you think seek God? Don't answer that. We'll just let Scripture tell us. Romans 3, 10 through 12. This is the description of all the people seeking God. You ready? As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Not even one. How many people seek for God? That'd be nobody. And what's the point? The point is that we are not believers because we're so holy and so smart and God is so blessed because we chose him. Wow, how how he just warms to the fact that we were kind enough and gracious enough to choose him to be our savior. Do you catch how silly that sounds? (laughs) He chose us. God chose us. And who was he choosing? Here's a, here's a great thing to think about. Was he choosing holy people? Nope. Good people, at least, maybe? Partially good? Actually, we just looked at Romans 3.12, says, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Who did he choose? Well, worthless people who don't do any good, not even one, that's all. That's who he chose. Wow. I I think the phrase, too, I'm going to need another mic. We're already cutting out here. I don't know why, but that's a few times. Um, Can you imagine telling a lot of people in our society that they're worthless? It's kind of frowned upon. And yet, Scripture says that without Christ, how are we? Worthless. No one does good. We don't like that truth. We want to think that we're at least moderately good. Scripture doesn't give that option. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans 5, 8. In fact, you look at verses 6 through 8. He says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, even though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here's what Paul does. He says, well, one might possibly die for a righteous person, but you're not one of them. He might die for a good person, but you're not one of those either. (laughs) But God shows his love for us in that he dies not for the righteous, not for the good, but for the sinners the unrighteous, the unholy, the unworthy, the undeserving, the worthless. Isn't that incredible? It is the ungodly that were chosen. You have a mic for me? You're the man. Thanks, buddy. 
Can you hear me now? All right. How many of you wish you couldn't hear me? Don't raise your hand. That's not nice. So it is the ungodly that were chosen. And you say, Pastor, why are you spending all this time talking about this? Because we're going to talk in a few moments about our behavior. And I think it's extremely important that you understand and believe properly about who you are before you engage in doing things that God calls you to do. Okay? It, it's really important we understand that relationship. We are going to do the things that he requires of us. Why? Because we are his chosen ones, holy and beloved. We don't do these things that he requires because we're trying to merit right standing before him. Friends, theology matters big time. And I am convinced there are many Christians, they'll say, well, I believe that I'm saved by grace, by cause of faith in Christ. Praise God. Amen. I'm with you. And then the rest of their lives, they do things for God as if he were some ogre that they're trying to appease. Maybe if I do these things, he'll, he'll really accept me. Or maybe you've done something in, lo in life and, and it, it just it weighs on you and you feel guilt and shame over it. And the Lord's forgiven you, but you, it's, it's a pressure on you. And you think, well, if I serve in the church and if I do this and I give money here and I do, God will, stop. Who are you in Christ? Chosen and beloved. That's who you are. And we don't do the behavior of the Christian walk because we're trying to appease a God we're terrified of. But rather, we walk in him because he has chosen us and he loves us. And you say, but I'm not worthy. Thank you for joining the club. None of us are. None of us are. There's not a single person. Billy Graham wasn't worthy. Charles Spurgeon wasn't worthy. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the words that we read, knew full well he wasn't worthy. What's he write in another place? He calls himself the chiefest of sinners. So we need to move past this understanding that somehow I've got to appease God and do these things he's asked me to do. No, you don't appease him. You simply walk in those things because you belong to him and he loves you deeply. Remember, and, and we... You say, Pastor, you've already used these verses that I'm about to read. That's okay. I'll use them again often. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Friend, if you were not saved by good works, are you somehow kept by them? No, you're not. Salvation is not a work of our own. Rather, we're saved by grace through faith in the one who does the saving. If our works were involved in salvation, we would be arrogant, Paul said. Verse 10 helps us in our continued look at this relationship between belief and behavior. He says we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. So why do we behave rightly? Well, we were created to do so. And I would say we were chosen to walk rightly. We are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The holiness is not our own. It was given to us. We are his beloved. By the way, so if you do all these things which we're about to talk to talk about in a moment, and we, we put on these, these spiritual virtues that Paul talks about, does that make us holy? No. Where, where's your holiness come from? We have the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's salvation. We are given his righteousness. You know why? Because our righteousness isn't good enough. <laughs> and no matter how many works you do, pre- or post-salvation, they don't make you holy. You walk in them because God created you to walk in them as his dearly beloved chosen ones. That love that we receive by him was initiated 
by him, not us. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I, I almost thought of making this whole sermon just on the one point this morning because I feel it's so important. And before I go to the next point, I just, I just want to say, if you're here this morning, you might need to be reminded that you are His chosen and you are loved. Don't go on in, in trying to do good works for the Lord if you aren't certain that He has chosen you and has loved you. Why? Because you're going to do works out of a wrong motivation. We don't do things for God because we're trying to please Him and get His, get his attention on us, His focus on us. Well, He'll bless me if I do this. Or, or he'll, he'll love me more. He couldn't possibly love you anymore, and He already does. I'm kind of convinced that that whole giving His life on the cross was sufficient to prove His love for us, right? I, I don't need to, to jump through hoops to try to get Him to love me more. No, you are chosen and beloved in the Lord. I know I'm making a strong point here, but I want you to catch it. And I want you to celebrate the fact that you're chosen by God and that you're loved by Him. Friends, that ought to, that ought to be the backbone in your walk. It ought to strengthen you. It ought, to, it ought to help you to stand up straight as a Christian, walking with the knowledge that you're chosen by God and loved by Him. All right. How many of you are thinking that we better get to the second point now? Good idea. We talked about chosen ones. Let's look at this idea of choosing ones. Verses 12 and 13 put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You see, chosen ones are choosing ones. In other words, those who are chosen by God make choices in walking with Him. Does that make sense? We are instructed to put on some holy virtues. And this is very consistent with the idea of wearing Christ's righteousness as a garment. How many of you got up this morning, took a shower, and then magically your clothes appeared on you? Anyone? You hopped out of the shower, bang! Bang! Wow, look at that. I'm fully dressed. Anyone? If anyone says yes to that, I really want to have a conversation after service. How many of you did not take a shower? Don't raise your hand. We know. Chosen ones are choosing ones. People who belong to the Lord live like the Lord. We, we choose to put on these virtues, and, and Paul spells them out for us here, right? He says compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness. There's an aspect in which we have to make decisions to live in a different way, don't we? How many of you realize there are going to be some times you have to make a choice to be compassionate? Because if you didn't make that choice, you'd be choking the person. Choosing to be patient, that's a tough one. We have to choose to bear with one another. Notice that it says to bear with one another, not be a bear to one another. Just saying. Now, you also can think of probably a different list of virtues found in Galatians 5, right? Galatians 5, 22 through 26, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. By the way, do you, do you see that there's a little overlap here between what's listed in Galatians 5 and what Paul's talking about here in Colossians? Some of those are talking about the same thing, isn't he? Uh, verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And look at this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one. Uh, verse 25 is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. If we live by the Spirit. Now, I grew up in a church that emphasized the Holy Spirit a lot. It's important that we do. 
If we live by the Spirit, then guess what? We need to keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, if you claim to have this relationship, you're believing rightly, you have a relationship with the Spirit of God, then you ought to be keeping in step with that Spirit of God, right? The way we believe affects the way that we behave. There's a relationship there. Now, these virtues, both in Colossians and Galatians, it says that we're to put on these virtues. So do we choose to put them on, or are they the natural spiritual fruit of having God's Spirit in us? Which is it? Yes. It's both. There's an aspect in which we, we need to daily, this idea of keeping in step with the Spirit, we might need to wake up and right after the cornflakes, we say, Lord, this, this is going to be a day and I'm going to need your help all day long. I'm going to have to deal with Ken today. God, help, please, mercy. I love you. Um, whoever it may be, right? And whatever situation we face, we depend on him for every step of the way, don't we? And so there is this aspect where certainly there's this fruit of the Spirit that kind of begins to, to show up in the life of the believer, but there's also that choice that I need to walk in it, and I need to make a choice. And I need to get uh, spiritually dressed. Now, when you get spiritually dressed, the Holy Spirit is there to help you put your spiritual clothes on. We need to choose to put those virtues on, and the Spirit is there enabling and empowering. Paul talks of the fruit of the Spirit, then says, keep in step with the Spirit. There's a relationship there, a partnership there. And I am so glad that God has given us His Spirit to help us to do the things He's called us to do. Again, when you read a passage of Scripture and it admonishes you to act a certain way, behave a certain way, have these virtues... And then you go off and say, I'll do that in my own strength, and I'll just go be holy. I'll just go off and do, just be ready for a big old pile of failure. God's not asking you to do things in your own strength. He's asking you to keep in step with the Spirit, walk with Him, as He empowers you to make that walk. The great John Calvin said, For what is more consonant with faith than to recognize that we are naked of all virtue in order to be clothed by God? That we are empty of all good to be filled by Him? That we are slaves of sin to be freed by Him? Blind to be illumined by Him? Lame to be made straight by Him? Weak to to be sustained by Him, to take away from us all occasion for glorifying that He alone may stand forth gloriously and we glory in Him. Friends, one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we believe right before we behave right is that if we don't, then God won't get the glory. If we don't believe properly, we think that somehow our efforts have some sort of uh, innate goodness We'll pat ourselves on the back and say, look how good I am. Look at all the stuff I did. What is John Calvin saying? He's saying, no, no, we're completely weak. We need his strength. We're completely sinful. We need his righteousness. We're completely without. And so we rely completely on him. And at the end of the day, when we begin to walk in his ways, who gets the glory? He does. Why? Because he did the work. <laughs> That's why clothed with the virtues of Christ. It is a work of God. By His power, He enables us, His chosen ones, to be choosing ones. And finally, we are charitable ones. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Notice here that Paul now speaks of the greatest virtue that God's chosen ones will choose, and that is love. In the passage we read in Galatians 5, we discovered that the very first fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13. How many of you have heard that described as the love chapter? How many of you have ever heard it described in that way I just said it? Doesn't matter. 
Basically, what does he say in 1 Corinthians 13? He says, if we do all kinds of great things, but we don't have love, we are obnoxious. He describes us as a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. This is why a loving person does not buy a drum set for a relative small child. They make noisy gongs and clanging cymbals, don't they? Now, if you don't like your relatives and they have a child, then by all means. I'm kidding. But you know that kid learning how to play and hitting all those things. You you almost can't see how cute they are. You just hear the noise of the drums being loudly played and not well. Now, I'm, I'm stretching the analogy a little bit. But God's chosen ones must choose to put on the righteousness of Christ and act in love. If any of the virtues that we claim to have put on are not expressed in love, no one's going to see the virtues that we claim. They're only going to see our unloving approach. They're not going to say, oh, how cute. What are they going to say? How obnoxious. That's what they're going to say. When Christians claim to have Christian virtues, but they're not loving, nobody sees Christ, they only see how obnoxious we're being. And that's why Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. And by the way, this is the uh, King James Version. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. I wanted, to, I wanted to read from the King James because they helped my point better, uh, talking about charitable ones. They use the word charity. But they're interchangeable in this context, right? Chosen ones are choosing ones who are charitable. They do things in love. Now, today our understanding of the word charity seems to be doing a deed for someone in need, right? Somebody's hungry, we give them food. That's a charitable act. And that's, that's true. There's no question about that. Not a bad understanding of the word. I, I think, I, I was thinking in my office, I was trying to remember where I heard this quote. As a pastor, I steal quotes from all kinds of places, and sometimes I can remember where I got them from, and sometimes I can't. Uh, Steve, maybe you'll remember, I think my dad said, don't just love there, do something. If nothing else, it sounds like something he would say. It's this idea of if you are truly acting in love, you're going to do something about it. 1 John 3, 16 through 18 The Apostle John says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Isn't that interesting? In deed and in truth, what I just read there, by what you believe and how you behave. All of that is done in love. Chosen ones choose to put on Christ's righteousness with charity. In conclusion, as we consider the overwhelming task of walking in God's ways, let's remember what we've learned here. First of all, we are chosen ones. And and I really can't emphasize this enough. If you haven't embraced fully, deep down to your toenails, (laughs) that God loves you and has chosen you, not because you're good, just give up on that. You're no good. And I'm not either. No one else is. But He loves you anyway. Yeah, I have to say it now like Dina's grandmother said to me, right? When I told her I was German. She said, Jesus, I love you anyway. He loves you to the core of your being, and He's chosen you. Understand that before you attempt to walk in His ways. Fundamentally important you understand that. 
as you understand that and as you walk in him, as you choose to put on these virtues, depend on the Holy Spirit. He is going to help you to walk in those ways. He's going to help you get spiritually dressed. (laughs) And thirdly, be sure to walk in those chosen ways by being loving. Don't just love there, do something. (laughs) Make sure you're loving because if you're not, you'll nullify what you're doing to those that observe. And they won't see the love of Christ. They'll just see you being something other than loving. (laughs) Chosen ones choose to put on Christ's righteousness with charity. Let's pray. Lord, we're always humbled when we hear your word. We're brought to a sense of awe and wonder because while we were sinners, you chose us and you loved us and you gave your very life for us. We can't comprehend it. We don't understand it, but we will forever celebrate it. And Lord, I ask that that truth would get deep into us And that it would impact and motivate how we live for you, these virtues that we put on. Clothe us with your righteousness, but help us to choose to walk in it, keeping in step with your Spirit. And help us to do this, Lord. Motivated and acting out in love. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen.